where are we with scientific understandings of climate change at, at the moment, generally speaking, and then where are we uh, in terms of uh, impacts on Michigan? All right. Well, I think first of all, just thank you for having me today. It's really um, a privilege to get to talk with you and to be in person. Um, so climate change. So I direct the Michigan Climate Action Network. Thousands of homes were flooded. A thousand cars were stranded, stranded on the, on the roads. roads. Um, also, this was one of many, this was one of many major storm that, storms over the summer that knocked out power at least five times over the summer. There were massive um, power losses for hundreds of thousands of people. So we're seeing the impacts. And then what we saw with the, what we're seeing with the science is another intergovernmental panel on climate change report was released this summer. The UN Secretary General called it a red code for humanity because um, it, it's sci there's scientific consensus that the impacts we're seeing now are going to get worse. And to avoid the worst consequences consequences, we need to cut emissions to zero by 2050 and in half by 2030, which is just, which is less than 10 years away now. So that's, that's kind, kind of, of the, the backdrop for the work that, that I do and for the, the conversation that we're having today. Okay, before I hand over to John, can yeah. you give us maybe one example then of the kind of work that, that you're doing? Yes. So the, the Michigan Climate Action Network, we are building a a large and diverse climate movement in Michigan so that we have the power to um, build the political will and address the solutions that we need. So one of the solutions that we're working toward is 100 So let me build on what Kate was talking about. But first I'll say a little bit about Michigan Energy Options. We're a um, clean energy, renewable energy nonprofit. We've been around since 1978. And uh, we work on policy to some extent, but we're more of an implementer of the project and program doer, if you will. We're part of the, the MICAN group um, and a number of others, but we really are looking at our niche to be making projects and things happen in, in the state. And an example that I can mention here is, is that we're working with the state of Michigan right now to help them onboard solar projects. So while the governor has you know big goals, she's also wise enough to know that you actually have to work towards those goals. They can't just sit out there as aspirations. And so we're helping the state of Michigan agencies like the Department of Natural Resources actually get solar on some of their properties to begin the process of, of you know, reducing the reliance on carbon as, as their own fuel source, and essentially walking the walk, if you will. Um, let me say a couple other things about what Kate was just talking about weather events. You may have seen the news this week from the Journal of Science saying that young people like you can expect to have seven times more, you know, um, extreme weather events in your lifetime. You can expect to have more wildfires, more droughts, more of this kind of stuff than people of my of my age. You've got a roller coaster ahead of you in terms of extreme weather. This was a, you know, a, a journal article in Science, a very reputable magazine. To bring that home a little bit more, Kate mentioned some of the issues we've been having the summer alone. Um, the Michigan Public Service Commission, which is the regulatory body that regulates, among other things, uh, our energy sector, recently came out with a report that we were part of, and I think you guys were part of it as well, looking at new technologies and business solutions to these issues around energy. And they included in this mentioned the fact that in August, August 12th, I think it was, this year, we had that extreme wind that was tornado-like or to Rachel Shears, you name it, that um, was one of the worst windstorms consumers in DTE or two industrial utilities have seen in 100 years. Well, we know that 500-year floods are not 500 years apart, and 100-year wind events are not 100 years apart. That, that storm knocked out power for a million people. Our population in the state of Michigan is 10 million. That's one out of 10 people, one out of 10 of you in this room probably we could have been without power, depending where you are in the state, for a week or two during August, where it can be quite hot. So the issue, from my perspective, about climate change and greening our grid and renewable energy isn't just more wind turbines somewhere, uh, but it's about really thinking about resilience. So we can talk more about that as we get along. Let me ask the one question that may be on somebody's mind. 
and that is, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not, we're not seeing as many climate change deniers as we were you know, about three or four years ago. It's more bipartisan, more people are acknowledging it, accepting the science. But there's still an awful lot of skepticism about the model, right, and how reliable the science is. Yeah, things are changing. You know, do we really know what the cause is? Do we really know that it's as bad as everybody is saying? That um, I'm not asking you to get into the nitty gritty of the science, but when you run up against, yeah, you know, it's who, who knows if it's really as bad as you're making it out to be. Do you have a kind of standard response to that? Um, there's there's no more rigorous science than and nothing more scientifically studied than climate change. We, it's, um, it's undeniably um, caused by human activity and the burning of fossil fuels. And there has been a huge amount of um, investment by the fossil fuel industry, the wealthiest industry on the planet to undermine um, the scientific evidence, to plant seeds of doubt. This is well documented by the Los Angeles Times and other, um, other newspapers have have done investigative journalism into like Exxon and other companies to show that there has, they have been doing, they were doing science in the 1970s to look at the impacts of climate change and the causes of climate change. And they came to some, um, the same conclusions. And then they chose to, um, to, instead of taking action to change their practices or to, you know, lobby government to move us off of fossil fuels and avoid the impacts that we're having, they um, they chose to invest in um, lobbying to to prevent any action from being taken to protect their industry, and so that has changed now um, because public awareness. Because we're seeing it with our own eyes, you can't deny that climate change is happening anymore. And those that that, that have been have an interest in um, preventing action on climate change have changed tactics where now it's more about um, slowing down the action that is necessary, um, but they're not gonna outright say, oh, climate change isn't happening because that's not palatable anymore. No one would believe them. But there, there are other things that we're seeing like um, supporting false solutions. Like we're not gonna, we don't need to ratchet down our use of fossil fuels. We're going to instead invest in carbon carbon capture and sequestration, which is, you know, so that's one example where we're gonna invest in technology that may or may not come to fruition um, down the road instead of doing what's necessary right now to address the urgent need in this this window that we have to, to cut emissions. So that's my answer. Yeah, that's a good answer. I, I might go back to what Michael was talking to you folks about before we got started here, this notion of you're writing an essay of some sort, you need to have some sources cited. Uh, I'm an environmental historian by my own training, so um, I know what academics is like. And if you're citing a bunch of black job sources in the paper to counter some prevailing idea out there, then you're really probably not being a rigorous intellectual or a student at that point. And so this issue around whether climate change is real or not, the overwhelming scientific community globally, locally, regionally, at our major universities around the world say it is, at our major institutions, NASA, you know, you name it say it's a real thing. So those who are in the business like the oil and gas industry of denying this or trying to undercut it, point to some obscure study that somebody's done and nobody's ever heard of or some, some researcher who's willing to take a contrary position because they're likely being funded to do that. And it doesn't hold up. So I think uh, the evidence is there, blown past that the need for that evidence. It's time to get Get cracking. And let me just use an analogy real quick. Um, I worked for the Nature Conservancy, which is an international conservation organization, for about a decade. Um, that's an organization concerned with the extinction of species, among other things, biodiversity. Um, just this week, another news item came out that, oh, well, it turns out, yeah, you know, um, this ex extinction thing is real. We've lost 20 species in the United States <coughs> that they finally confirmed are gone for good, the birds and other kinds of Creatures. We've known this for a long time. We've suspected this for a long time, but it took decades for somebody to kind of conclude, well, yeah, you know, and there goes 20 species. Now, what if we had really listened to the experts 20 years ago, 40 years ago? Might we be able to do something 
to save those species. Maybe, maybe not. But the time for climate change is already going past it. It's time to listen, time to act, and not wait for that moment when the evidence is absolutely absolute. Do the, uh, the industries that are denigrated, do we have, is there anything to be said for that in terms of turning that back on us and saying, well, look, look how you like to live. Look at the tremendous amount of energy that you use every day, including in this room. Summer was really hot. Turn my air conditioning on. I drive my car. Um, you guys, you know, we, you say that you want you know, uh, a different or better world, one in which climate change is less of a threat, but your own actions don't back that up. Um, you want what we provide. They are saying that. And in fact, it was fossil fuel industries that created the whole carbon, um, calculate your carbon footprint model where it's like turning it back on us. Like, well, look, you're you're actually making these choices. But the choices that I make, while important, I believe that we need to do everything that we can. It's really a drop in the bucket compared to decisions that are made at the at the utility level or at the fossil fuel, you know, the oil company level. And so um so I think that that's another strategy to and also I think that's a really disempowering message and it makes us feel like um, like we don't, you know, like, oh, well, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I can't stop driving my kid to school, so I guess I can't do anything. Um, one of Megan Owens, who runs Transportation Writers United in Detroit, wrote a great op-ed about, um, about this, how she would love to take public transportation to visit her, her mom, take her kids to see her, but it would take like four buses and like four hours to get there rather than hopping in her car. So it's, we don't have all the options. We don't have the things available to us to make the decisions that we would like to make because of the, the bigger, the macro level. So while we need to take action at the individual level, I think that's really important. We also need to be taking action to influence. So at the making political change and, and, and forcing the change to happen at the, at the larger level as well. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure you have all that much to add to it. I think we do become conditioned with time. We do end up becoming kind of like thinking consumers, perhaps. But also, we, some of us are making conscious choices about where we shop, um, where we get our food, uh, recycling some of those types of things, our, our vehicle miles we drive. Um, that, all, that all matters. I don't think you should stop doing that, but as Kate is saying here, you should also agitate for change in those institutions and those places where you live or work. The Grand Valley doing everything you can? I don't know. Are you, do you guys know? Maybe, maybe not. What about Grand Rapids? Grand Rapids is really one of the emblematic cities in the state for doing all kinds of good things around sustainability. Are they still on top of their game? Are they doing as much as they could be doing? Uh, so I, I guess I would just suggest that if there is personal responsibility to this kind of thing, an ethical responsibility you have. But as Kate is saying, you need to hold those people who are in positions of power, who are oftentimes making decisions on your behalf, to those same standards. So John, can you give us a, a picture of energy in Michigan? Um, you know, where do we get energy from? Is there, are there trends in the directions of renewables? Uh, and, and maybe piggybacking on what you both just said, um, fossil fuel industries have no shortage of cash, same with utilities. What what prevents them from pivoting themselves and, and beginning to provide some of the renewables as part of their own business model? Well, if you look at some of the large oil and gas multinationals, um, Exxon, BP, Chevron, a lot of those companies are investing heavily in solar. In fact, they own solar subsidiaries. So they are moving in that direction pretty hard. Uh, they're not abandoning at this point the oil and gas revenues, but they're moving into what we would consider renewable energy. And the question you have to ask yourself, the question I ask myself, is why would Chevron or BP be moving into this arena? Well, part of it is because of market forces, and this is going to be at some point, ideally, um, the dominant source of, of energy for, for us. But I've also thought this, is that as we move to electric vehicles, and we get Ford and GM lined up, 
Does that mean that I plug in my EV to either consumers or GT and that's my only choice? If you think that the oil and gas industry, which is arguably more powerful than a local utility, even a utility the size of consumers or GTE, you think they're just going to give up the transportation industry and say, well, we had a hell of a 125-year run and we're just going to give up on that revenue stream now? I don't think so. So I think one of the reasons oil and gas probably is moving to renewables is that they want to be somehow in the game of providing power to electric vehicles. That gets tangled up in our utility laws and our utility policy, because for the most part in the United States, you are essentially a trapped customer by the virtue of where you live. You don't have choice for where your electricity comes from. If you live in Grand Rapids, you've got consumers. If you live in Detroit, you have DTE. So these are regulated monopolies. And the reason there's not a lot of competition in this space, so to speak, is that nobody wanted to see 142 wires coming into GVSU from 142 different utility providers, right? That's not very efficient. But that's all becoming challenged now, especially with the idea that you can generate, self-generate behind the meter. Some are all the energy that you need. We do have choice in the state of Michigan. It's only 10%. And it's something the utilities fight all the time. Uh, but I think what's going to happen is we're going to see our energy markets more and more become um, distributed, become more competitive, uh, be, have more options for the consumer. And I think all that will be a good thing in, in the long run. But it's going to be messy for a while. For right now, at least, utilities continue to have essentially control of how energy is produced, where it's consumed, and all those kinds of things. They are moving in the right direction. Are they moving as quickly as we'd like to see them move? No, but they're moving quickly. And it seems to me every time um, we hear from them that they're going to be more ambitious about closing coal plants than we thought, earlier than we thought, and they sound more ambitious about bringing on renewables. So I, I want to accept that for space value and be encouraged by it. If I can follow up, what's the percentage of, of energy that's generated by renewables right now? Michigan's about 11, 11%, 12%, somewhere in there. Um, half of that, more than half of that is coming from wind power. Um, we work in the solar arena ourselves. Like I said, we're working with the state of Michigan DNR. We actually own and operate something called the Community Solar Park. Um, solar is is relatively small chunk of it now, 3 4%, but it's growing. Um, right now, Michigan has three gigawatts of wind power in the state. That's 3,000 megawatts, which is 30,000 kilowatts. You can do the, you can do the math. Um, that's about 1,500 or more turbines spinning around. They expect we're going to go to 3.5 gigawatts maybe by the end of this year. That said, solar in the state of Michigan is only at half a gigawatt, but. Consumers alone has plans to put eight gigawatts of solar in play between now and 2040, I think, is their, is their ambitions. And to do that, they're going to have to put 500 megawatts of new solar in the ground year over year. Every year for the next X amount of years, 500 megawatts of solar. So we're going to see an incredible amount of blue panels where we live and work uh, around the state of Michigan. Wind is probably, at this point, tapering off, um, not, not because the wind resource has been all used up, but there's just a lot of local concerns, if not opposition to wind farms um, in their communities. We can talk about that perhaps. Do you have any other um, stats that come to mind? No, stuff? I think you covered it, covered it well. So that's it, so it's about 11% of the pie. Um, coal is going away, natural gas, Combined cycle is coming on strong. We're closing a major nuclear plant next year. Right? I'll say it's shutting down. So where is that energy coming from? Well, nationally at least, renewables can beat natural gas, the price point. So what's we're seeing more and more are large solar farms and wind farms in states to our west that probably are going to be supplying us on transmission lines going forward while we also build out our own resources here in the state. Speaking of our own resources, um, your organization is on record as being against the Enbridge line, is that correct? Yes. You are? Yes. Can you say a little bit, again, the, the idea there is 
at least in the meantime, we're going to need energy probably from outside sources. So why the opposition to the bridge? So the mission, we've been involved with um, the effort to shut down Line 5 since the beginning. We were one of the co-founders of the Oil and Water Don't Mix Coalition. And, and um, in part because it... The Line 5 oil pipeline that runs on, through the Great Lakes, that's 68 years old, I think now, um, puts the Great Lakes at such risk of a catastrophic, catastrophic spill. Also, even when there isn't a spill, every day it pumps 23 million gallons of oil through our state that, when it's burned, releases huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. Um, so we are opposed to Line 5. We want to shut down Line 5. We're also working right now and focusing a lot of our energy and and preventing an oil tunnel. And Enbridge wants to build an oil tunnel. And we're intervening with the Environmental Law and Policy Center and at the Michigan Public Service Commission. And we're, this is the first case that a state where a state agency is considering climate change in its decision about, uh, in an agency decision. And so it's actually true that we can shut down Line 5 and not replace it. That is a viable alternative. Um, and part of that, part of the big concern for the state is how will we get propane to the Upper Peninsula where there, there's a, a large amount of people that rely on it for their heating. And there have been a number of studies, um, the UP Energy Task Force looked at this most recently and have found that, that there are alternative ways to get propane so that people can continue to heat their homes and that we can be moving off of propane to um, heat pumps to electrifying our home heating, which is cost effective and is where we should be moving anyway. And so, um, so we just submitted our expert testimony and found the experts who did, who ran the numbers found that if we shut down line five and don't build an oil tunnel, we will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, 27 million metric tons a year, which is equivalent to about 6.8 coal plants or 6 million cars on the road. So it's a big climate issue as well. I'm trying to keep track of the math as you're talking, both of you. Yeah. Um, so the, the 2030 target is <clears throat> half the emissions? Globally. Globally. Mm -hmm. 2050, zero. Mm -hmm. Am I right to think that what you're saying is the technology is there? The, re the possibility that we can get there through renewables is a real one. Um, it's more a matter of political will than it is technology, or is that overstating the simple line? That, I think that's absolutely true. Yeah, so we have all the technology that we need. Because we've waited so long, it's going to, we have to move really fast, and um, it's it's the political will that we need. We're starting to see that we have the political will. Um, the Biden administration has proposed the Build Back Better plan. It's right now, like as we speak, being negotiated in Congress this would be three and a half trillion dollars of investments and billions of dollars in clean energy investments, which would move us to 100% renewable electricity by 2035, would, could fully electrify transportation. This is what we need to do. It wouldn't get us all the way there, but it would be up. You know, we have this window by 2030, we need to cut emissions in half. We have this huge opportunity in Congress where we have, um, a majority of pro-climate Congress people in the House. We have a champion in the White House and we have a razor thin Democratic majority in the Senate. We've only had that in the past 40 years, four years. So this is such a critical window within this time frame where we have to act. Um, so that's that's one example of how like we're starting to have the political will to make major changes happen. Um, but I, as somebody who's just going about my life, driving to work, living in my house, it, could all this happen without me noticing any particularly drastic change in my own life? Or would I have to be involved in some way to get on board, to change something about the way that I live? It goes back to the personal responsibility question, but also just, it's like, cool, yeah. um, if even if it costs me an extra hundred bucks a month, could all this happen? without it really affecting how I'm living? Would that be great? <laughs> I just think the example of Germany, which has been out ahead of a lot of other countries for years with their renewables, but also their energy efficiency. So I always point out that 
the average utility bill for a German household is higher than we would pay here. Except they use so much less energy than we use here that it becomes pretty commensurate. So does that make sense? So in other words, their energy costs are higher there per kilowatt hour. But because they have energy efficient appliances and buildings and they've got solar on the roof, their actual out of pocket cost is about the same, if not less than we pay here. So one way to think about this kind of issue is like, can you reduce your consumption? And there's lots of ways to do that that are uh, efficiency, which is technology. Conservation would be to turn the lights off here, but I realize we're filming today, Michael, so I won't give you a hard time about that. Conservation is just turning the switch off, right? It's thinking about those kinds of things. So those are all within our, in our, at our disposal. So you can do those kinds of things. I think per kilowatt hour, probably energy is going to get more expensive. One of the, the mantras that the utilities talk about all the time is affordability, making energy affordable. That's why they're doing what they're doing. But that's a problematic stance sometimes because they are constantly in front of the Michigan Public Service Commission requesting rate increases. And typically, uh, utilities go for rate increases anywhere from 2 to 4% per annum year over year over year over year. Moreover, a lot of our low to moderate income populations struggle to pay their utility bills in, in the states and in Michigan as well, as much as 20, 30% of their disposal disposable income is going towards their energy burden. So I think we need to figure out ways where we're focusing on how we make energy affordable and clean, but also equitable. And that's an important piece of all of this, is that we kind of, the, the, the rate paying systems in the utilities is just kind of complex and doesn't make sense. You know who pays the least kilowatt hour for electricity among the various sectors out there anybody have a guess residential no nope. pay the most commercial second most least industrial why well because they use a lot of energy right and it's expensive for them to do all what they do because they have to produce things that's the model we have is that is that the right model I don't know. Yeah. one of the things industrials can do though and they're doing more and more of this is self-generate so despite having low rates coming from the utilities a lot of places you know, a lot of um, companies and big producers of cars and the rest, GM and others, are putting solar on their operations or adding batteries to their operations. So that's the kind of trend we need to really see and encourage is having reducing the, the consumption happening that's going back to that coal plant or that natural gas plant and relying on the utility provider. We need to do some of the things we can do on our own properties. And I want to I want to say to that question that we we're going to see a lot of changes around us that are going to be so beneficial. We're going to see so many new jobs in the clean energy industry. New businesses are starting up. If we could level the playing field, it, it would help a lot. If we get these investments in renewable energy, and it would help a lot. We're going to see a lot more clean energy jobs. We're going to see reductions in pollution. The asthma rates are going to go down. Communities are going to be healthier. Um, so we're going to see so many benefits. There was actually a study out of Stanford that looked at getting to 100% renewable energy is possible. It will also, also save people $1,000 on average in healthcare costs. It'll reduce your energy costs and it'll save lives and, um, and create jobs for Michigan. I can't remember all the numbers, but it's really impressive numbers. There are a lot of benefits. It's not all about like suffering. So we can get to this. But then at the same time, I think about how, how much am I willing to sacrifice so that my grandkids can see a coral reef or a sequoia, you know, sequoia national park, or don't have to, um, you know, suffer through flooding in our community. And we think about the past two years, look how much we've changed because of COVID. You know, we're all wearing masks right now. We, you know, we all work from home. Um, there, humans can be really resilient. Um, hopefully we can move through this soon. And, um, you know, and not saying that COVID was a, COVID has been a terrible thing, but it's an example of how much we can change when we need to and adapt. And, um, and I think it's, 
you know, I think people can can make a lot of changes, um, and it, it won't hurt. And there are going to be a lot of a lot of positive things that come as a benefit of addressing the climate crisis and moving to clean energy. One of the things we've been talking about in class is it seems to be very much on the minds of at least numbers of students is the huge divide in polarization. So when you bring up the COVID, I, seem, I think on one hand, yes, but I don't know that I'm ready to hold up the U.S. as somehow a model for cooperation you know, in terms of response. And if this, as many people have said, um, COVID in some way could be seen as a dry run for these increasing climate crises, I don't know how confident I am that my fellow citizens will cooperate in the ways that you're suggesting. I, I want to believe that, that we would all come to some agreement that yes, this is an existential threat. Yes, you know, we could all benefit in the end if we did pull together and went through this transition period, even if there was some upfront cost to it. Um, as well as I look around the country, I'm, I'm confident. I think one example I'm thinking of is that um, a lot of people have learned how to work from home. Um, my husband, for example, is an attorney, and that profession, a lot, you know, it's, you can't really work from home, it's not set up, and then they all had to work from home. And so a lot of people, like the state of Michigan employees, have, have worked from home, which reduces a lot of traffic pollution. It um, saves saves energy. Um, some some studies have, you know, found that it will, it will, in some cities that are trying to decarbonize, having a lot of people work from home and not commute is part of the solution. And we found that we can do that. So, and also like a lot of us prefer to work from home. Some state employees now are able to live in other places and, and work remotely for the long term now. So I think that's the kind of example that I'm pointing out. I agree. There's, um, there's a lot of, um, there's not, there, you know, we're in a very, very challenging time in our country with um, polarization. Um, but I think that we can see that there, there are some behavioral changes that we didn't think were possible. And um, now we see that, that they are possible, like working from home. Although I do miss um, in-person events like this. So it's, this is very nice. <laughs> I look forward to getting back to this. <laughs> I don't know if you pick up on that, John. I do have a specific question here around in terms of what we can do. Um, the question is, could you speak to the buying in uh, aspect of programs like consumers, or consumers, uh, the Michigan Renewable Energy Credits? In other words, uh, yeah. you know, there are things that we could do. Yeah. That things that utilities could do as well, maybe to encourage the kinds of behaviors that it's referring to. So that's probably in reference to consumers voluntary green pricing program, perhaps. Um, I think it is. A number of utilities have those kinds of programs. I'm going to sidestep that though and tell you what I think is a better model. And it's one that we've been involved with. I think I mentioned that we own and operate a community solar park. Uh, the model for community solar, I think, is a good one. We have in Michigan, a handful of examples of something called community solar. How many of you have ever heard of the terminology? Even? Well, it suggests, as you might imagine, there's community involved and there's solar involved, right? So the idea there is that you, as a community, would get together and say, we'd like to locate solar somewhere in our community where we can be a participant in that project. We can invest in that project. We can get a return on our investment every month as an on-bill credit for what we've put into the project. And we can then kind of virtually be the recipients of clean, renewable energy in our community. When people ask what they can be doing about the climate crisis, I say, well, something which is real tangible and doable is getting involved with community solar. It's local, and here's some other benefits to it. Our project on purpose is located on a closed landfill, cap landfill, municipal dump, call it what you will. There's not gonna be any reuse for that property ever. Nobody's going to put a Tim Hortons there or a daycare center, right? It sits there, unusable. So, and we have all kinds of closed landfills in the state of Michigan. A lot of times you drive around the southern tier here, you see something like, a, geez, where'd that big mountain come from? That's not a mountain, that's a dump, right? Um, so there's plenty of opportunity in the state of Michigan to be 
building solar on landfill sites or other marginal lands, brownfields. We have lots of legacy brownfields. The project with the DNR we're working on, we've got two former mining sites. We're going to be locating solar on those sites. So those are your know, legacies of an industrial period of time, which, which was great for Michigan, but it's ended now. And now we can instead do something which is more 21st century by putting solar on those sites. Additionally, to the point of kind of carbon capture and doing as much as you can, our site in East Lansing has pollinators and native grasses we planted there. So we're doing habitat restoration. So we're ha helping birds and bees and such like that to have a habitat. And also the, in turn, the bees, certainly the pollinating bees are critical to Michigan's agricultural economy. So there's a number of multipliers happening to a project such as that. But here's the rub. Um, consumers have something called the Consumers Solar Gardens. Go online, take a look, see, decide if it works for you or not. I'm not going to say any more about that. But I've gone around and spoken to a no number of um, city leaders, utilities around the state, saying, hey, let us work with you and get a community solar park going. And I tell them about it, and they're like, that sounds like a good idea. And they say, nobody in my community has come to talk to me about it. You care about it. Nobody else cares about it. Why would we do that? So that's one of the ways, you know, that as community members, active community members, you can get involved and make a difference in your community. And I think putting online a megawatt or two megawatts or five megawatts of community solar on a former brownfield site within your community is a tangible, actionable, real dog in the fight approach to climate change. Yeah, I just want to add to that. Something that's so great about community solar too is not everyone has a home where you can put solar on your rooftop and not everyone can afford that. And so when you build community solar, you can buy in at whatever level you want to. It's also when you go, when you build a larger array, it brings the cost down for everyone. It's more cost effective. Um, and you know, if you have a shady home or if you live in an apartment, it, it makes it accessible to, to everyone. Yeah. So I think that's really powerful. And I also think the taking action locally is, um, I wanted to to um, lift that up too, because that's, it can feel very disempowering. Climate change, um, that, you know, energy system is really big and it can feel really like, what impact can I really make? But starting locally um, is, you know, I think that's where, where every great movement has started is locally. And there's so much you can do at the local level. I mean, you know, what is GVSU doing on on, on its, with its energy? And and um, a lot of universities have climate plans. I don't know, maybe maybe you have one. Um, do you? Uh, we regularly figure in the top 25 most sustainable uh, universities in the, in the country. I, I raised this question, uh, uh, another discussion that we did a couple of years ago, just before COVID and I can maybe I can turn it back to you as a question, and then we have another ten minutes. So if we have questions, um, we'll get to questions in just a minute here. But my question to the Grand Valley person was: It sounds a little self-congratulatory, right? We're in the top twenty-five. We must be doing well, but we can be patting ourselves on the back even as the ship still sinks, right? We did what we thought was the right thing to do, and it was a good thing to do, but it still wasn't enough. I mean. Sure, I think they feel the same way. I'm not sure, but as I read the literature on climate change, it seems to me that radical, fairly drastic actions what called, is what's called for, not kind of slow incremental action uh, in terms of staving off the worst of it, right? Going past various tipping points. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're all saying, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Um, is, is it enough? It hardly ever seems to be, no matter who you are. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the IPCC numbers are a good guideline. We need to cut emissions in half by 2030 globally and um, to zero by 2050. So a lot. So that means that the U.S., because we have more resources than some of the rest of the world, needs to move even faster. So you look at the University of Michigan has set a, um, a carbon neutrality goal. Um, and so shooting for... Um, more ambitious goals that align up with the science is something that's really what's necessary. And also, you can also get involved locally um, with a with an organization. I wrote some down. Um, there's the Grand Rapids Climate Resolution Coalition. 
There's um, WEMIAC, which is in West Michigan. There's the Sierra Club has a chapter over here. Um, Michigan League of Conservation Voters has a chapter here. Um, so there's a, there are a lot of ways to get involved locally with an organization already doing work that you can plug into things that you're that you're interested in and find other like-minded people. Yeah. We all of the above. I mean, one of the things about if you're if you're engaging with your local local elected officials um, or your commissions, often those folks end up going on further up the food chain, if you will, in politics. So they end up becoming state senators or state representatives. And some of them, even then from there, move on to the federal level. So Andy Levin's a friend of mine. He's a House representative. He worked um, for years at DLEG in the state of Michigan. He um, ran um, our PACE program here in the state. And, and I'm in regular conversations with Andy and his staff. He's got an EV bill in place. And I've got, you know, I've got at least a conversation I can have with him. I can point to others. Uh, I happen to spend a lot of time in East Lansing when I went to Michigan State. I knew our representative in the state house from there. Her name is Debbie Stabenow. She's now our senator. I knew another one, Gretchen Whitmer. She's now our governor. So getting active locally doesn't mean it necessarily ends there. It may, in fact, carry on for you to have being able to be active either at the state or federal level. So I think that's all very important. And I want to see one more example of a, of a local action to what Kate's saying about getting kind of involved. Well, I live over near Grand Haven and the Grand Haven Board of Light and Power has closed a coal plant some years ago. Yay. And then they came around and said they wanted to build a natural gas combined heat and power plant in its place. Some locals became concerned about whether that expensive plant was necessary. It was going to be something called a peaker plant, which means they were only going to use it a little bit out of every year, but it was going to be a pretty substantial cost to the community. And not only that is that yeah, natural gas is 85% cleaner than burning dirty coal. But that's not really a nice, that's not really a, that's a distorted comparison, if you will, because it still is creating greenhouse gases. And certainly the fracking of it, the transportation of it, the leakage of methane and all the rest, if you look at it during that whole supply stream, it's not a clean fuel. It is. It's better than coal. But, you know, coal is better than burning wood. You know what I mean? So whatever. So we have to compare it that way. But anyway, a group became very concerned about Grand Haven Board and Lake Power doing this. The Grand Haven Council was going to kind of green, just green light it and let it go through. They got active. They had public forums. I spoke at one of these. They had meetings with the city. They brought a lot of other experts in to talk about the alternatives. Little by little, they ground away at this plan for this plant. A um, bunch of gray hairs doing it, showing up at all these meetings. And what really maybe made, made the difference, I think it did. Recently, the city council had a vote about whether they would approve the, the BLP moving forward on this plant or they would maybe, maybe delay their decision to think it through a little bit. What happened was that a bunch of young people, younger than you guys, high school kids and others, showed up at the city council meeting and they had their three minutes at the mic. And it's not, not nice to do that kind of thing. You've ever had to get up in front of a big room and speak your mind in, in a situation that you've got to have guts. You gotta be willing to be able to put it out there. And they spoke about how putting a natural gas plant right there in Harbor Island, right in the mouth of the Grand River, right where Lake Michigan floods in, where there's all these issues around flooding and drought, I mean, flooding and the rest, that was sacrificing their future and they were against it. And the council listened. They didn't listen to the gray hairs so much, listen to the young people. And subsequently the Grand Haven Board of Light and Power has for now, at least, they've mothballed any idea of moving forward with a, a natural gas plant. That's a David and Goliath story. That's a heck of a win. You don't see that that often. Yeah. And it happened. And I think it happened in part because younger generations are involved. So I would just say to you that you know, get involved. There's groups like Kate Rattelock, there's my group, there's her group, there's other ways you can become involved. The policies your thing become that, but the programs are your things, do that. But we need people. Yeah, we need, that's the answer, Michael, I think I give, is that if you're a consumer by day, then make up for a little bit of your consumption by joining groups like ours and trying to make a difference. Yeah. You sleep better in that. <laughs> some questions. Sure, yeah. We've got just five minutes left. Anybody have a question they want to ask of either one of the, both of the speakers as we start to wind down? Yes. 
So you mentioned um, that the uh, Build Back Better plan, they're supposedly voting on it today, but they're also voting on the federal bipartisan bill at the same time, or supposedly, mm -hmm. say that, uh, because we never know what else is going to do. Um, so my question is, is with all the money that's in politics from big business, which is broadcast, or not broadcast, but it's put all, all out there because they have to, um, how do you feel that, what is your estimation of how positive you're going to be about how that all is going to work out um, with uh, big business or big business still being able to put money into politics mm -hmm. and how that plays into climate change and everything else? Yeah. I, the, my answer to that is that we have to do it. We have to get it through. Um, and this is our moonshot. This is, and this is our opportunity. And so it is, um, I think you really hit the nail on the head that money in politics is so tied into um, climate solutions and having the political will. Um, as is making sure we have a, a strong democracy. So like the redistricting we're seeing in Michigan is so important. Um, I, I wish that I knew. I don't think anybody knows what how this is going to, I don't even think Nancy Pelosi knows how this is going to play out. Um, but I will say that, that Senator Manchin, um, you know, gets, some, he's one of the two key senators that we're waiting to see. And he gets more fossil fuel money than any other senator. So that's really concerning to me. Um, but we have to get it done and the nation is counting on them. And I, I'm hopeful that those two people will, um, will not stand in the way of not only like our chance